as we go through this evening's presentation, if I mention a brand name or a trade name, just understand it's not any sort of approval on me or any sort of endorsement from myself or the university, just so that we can have a clear conversation and it's an example. And of course, if we don't mention a similar product, it's not in any way disparagement of those products. So just understand we do not uh, endorse any sort of projects or suppliers or anything of that nature. So what we're gonna look at tonight is cane berries. We're gonna be talking about the flora cane fruiting blackberries and then the flora cane fruiting raspberries. And then we'll talk about the prima cane fruiting. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, we'll get into that, we'll explain that. And then we'll do grapes. And again, blueberries is actually going to be reserved for uh, the next class we have on February the 20th. So no blueberries tonight. If you join for that reason. I apologize, but you are more than welcome to hop off if the other topics aren't of interest to you. So when we're talking about caneberries and brambles, it's another name for our caneberries or blackberries and raspberries. Um, we're approaching it completely different from fruit trees. So if you have experience with fruit trees or if you were at the last class, uh, to a certain extent, you can kind of ignore or forget most of that. And the reason, of course, is that we're dealing with, although they're perennial, they're technically biennial, the individual plants. And so we don't do the same test. We're not creating an architecture for a tree that's gonna be there for years. So we do things in a little bit different manner. But there's a few similarities, and we'll try to point those out so it reinforces. Uh, but basically, we're looking at what do we do at planting? What are we doing that first year during summer, if anything? What about the dormant season? And what about other summer years? So after they become established. And it does change. So beginning is a little bit different than once we get established. So I've already said this, they're biennial and growth habit, which means it takes two years for them to complete their life cycle or to bear fruits or make seeds. We have the flora cane, which is where we have um, a, a vegetative growth the first year. We call that a primocane. So primocane is that first year's growth. There's no flowers there. So anytime you have most of our blackberries, for instance, if you go out to the blackberry patch, you're going to see a lot of canes that are growing. If it's towards the end of the season, they're going to be very large, but you're not going to see flowers on them or spent flowers or old fruit because they didn't flower at all. That's this year's vegetative growth. You will find those canes that have flowered or do have fruit on them at the time. Those are actually last year's vegetative growth that had turned or matured into flora canes. And of course, flora canes noting they had flowers this year. So it's a biennial growth habit. First year is vegetative. And then the second year, that same cane matures into a flora cane and it actually flowers. So what are primocane fruiting? Well, we just said primocane is that first vegetative year. For some raspberries and some blackberries, they will fruit on that first year's growth, late summer or early fall. So they're primocane fruiting. You'll see these referred to in catalogs and things such as fall bearing. Sometimes they're called ever bearing because not only do they fruit on the primocane, if we allow them to stay, those primocanes, they'll actually mature into a regular floricane the next season. And you'll have a second crop earlier in that summer season, like you normally would on floricane crops. So again, floricane fruit the second year, primocane fruiting fruit the first year. That's the difference. And so we have some different management options because of that difference in uh, growth habit. Primocane typically produce their largest and best fruit crop on the primocane, that first crop. Kind of makes sense because if you think about it, the floricane fruiters, they have one whole season and then basically until the, they begin fruiting to produce reserves to make that fruit. So they've got a lot of energy. Primocane, they grow one season fruit once, and then they have a shorter period of time to kind of rebuild those resources to fruit a second time. So especially in our area, the second fruiting on primocane typically is not as heavy or as good as that first year primocane fruiting. So we'll talk about why we might make a decision to only treat these 
as a one-year crop as opposed to a biennial in that case. We'll talk about that later. So when we look at our different cane berries, we do see some different growth habits. And because of that, there are a little bit of differences when it comes to how we prune and manage these. So basically we have upright or erect, we have semi-erect, and then we have trailing. And so each one of those is basically kind of fairly descriptive. You see a depiction there. Um, and there's not one that's better than the other. And so we just manage them a little bit differently. Uh, the erect uh, blue uh, berries, excuse me, not blue, but black and raspberries are more or less self-supporting. So if we wanted something that we did not have to trellis, I'd probably say, let's look at the erect varieties. That being said, trellises are still good. And we still like those. You can see there some uh, terms that you might hear me mention. Uh, one thing to be aware of is that we can have daughter plants forming. So if we have a cane or a bramble that comes in contact with the ground, it can root, it can start growing another plant, which is great if you want plants to give away or more plants uh, in your berry patch. We can also have um, our new primacanes, our vegetative growth arising from the crown. Some varieties we see more root suckers. So you see the sucker there. There's not anything wrong with a root sucker. It's just arising from a different point. But this is why we do kind of, especially out in the wild, we may find berry thickets, whether they're rooting where tips are coming in contact with the ground or we're having root suckers pop up. That's why a lot of times we find patches of berries. It's because of how they grow. Good and bad of that is we can have a few plants and end up with a much larger planting in the garden. But that can also mean sometimes we have to do some things to keep them in to into the areas we want them to be, keep them under control. So just understand you may have to do some actions or pruning to keep them sort of where you want them. I will say that you will notice that oftentimes the first year of growth is not maybe as erect as we might expect for those varieties, just because of everything they've gone through with transplanting and because of how we treat them when we plant them. So don't be surprised if you have some erect berries that look semi-erect or even trailing-ish that first year. Don't be too alarmed. You probably still do have the right variety. It's just that first year we can see a little bit less growth and vigor from them. Said it already, trellises are highly encouraged. It's less critical for our black raspberries, which are generally erect, as well as our erect blackberries. There's no one right form of trellis. So on the right-hand side, those three pictures are uh, depicting what we see most often at a commercial level, um, often referred to as a V trellis. There's two levels of wire holding them in. There's different ways of doing that. You can just kind of do a T post where you have two runs of wire and basically it just kind of corrals the berries in. It makes uh, the uh, harvesting of those berries easier. It gets them more upright so they're not sprawling into your row middles as much. Uh, we've got handouts in the back if you want to grab some of the presentation and follow along. Uh, we also have what sometimes refer to as an eye trellis. Uh, that's the one on the left. It doesn't have those horizontal crossbars, so it's not so much corralling them in, but we can tie things to those uh, wires, to those horizontal portions. Uh, there's nothing that says we can't start with one and convert to the other. So basically, you've got set post and then wires running. So you might start with an eye and then decide you need uh, something more controlling for your patch or the eye might work for you. So again, there's not a right or wrong, but there's a lot of options. And if you start digging deeper, there's even more complex examples than these. But these work pretty well and can adapt pretty easy in the home garden. Certainly, if you've got a French row that you want to grow things on or something like that, that's sometimes taking advantage of infrastructure you already have. So at planting, when we get our uh, berries in, most of the time we've got to stick with spaghetti at the end, basically. It's that plant with roots. Uh, typically they've already been pruned back some just so they're more of a moderate size for shipping. Uh, what we actually want to do is go ahead and cut that back to a couple or three buds uh, and have a very short plant that we're planting because we don't want to basically have a plant try to do floral production. We want it to go into vegetative growth. And so that's why we go ahead and cut these back. Uh, 
Um, and so don't be afraid to cut this back, kind of like with planting uh, the fruit trees where I encourage folks when you get them, go ahead and cut them back severely because we want to get things started off on the right foot. I don't want to see a plant this small, this disturbed by being dug and shipped, trying to fruit this year. That's going to set you up for a weaker plant more likely to see disease problems, which as a rule, our berries don't have a tremendous number of disease, diseases. There are some out there, uh, but I like a plant that's going to have the best chance, and that means pruning these back so we get uh, that growth going vegetatively that first year for sure. Sometimes people inherit berries in the garden, and so you may have the question, well, is this a blackberry or a black raspberry? Uh, if you put them side by side, I can probably tell you reliably which plant is which. If you have them separate, I don't know because there's always that variation in plants. But how I can tell pretty quick and easy is looking at the fruit. So if you've seen them fruit, when you have raspberries, you basically have what I like to think of as a thimble. That fruit is going to have a hollow portion in the middle. And what it is, what you see depicted there, the receptacle tissue and other fruits have receptacle tissue too. This is not only uh, to our berries, but on raspberries that stays attached to the plant. So that's why when you harvest in this instance there on the left, a red raspberry, you pull that fruit off, you end up with the receptacle attached to that cane and the berry without it. And so it has that hollow place in it. So even if that were black, if it's hollow, like we see in the uh, second picture of a black raspberry, we know that's a raspberry. It is not a blackberry because the blackberry on the right, we don't leave that behind on the plant. It's not hollow. When we pick it, it is inside of the blackberry. So it's a small difference, but it's an easy difference to tell them apart. So if you're not sure, take a look at this, send me some pictures and I can help you figure it out if you need to. But sometimes that's a useful uh, bit of knowledge if you're not sure what you have. Of course, you might just be worried how they taste and don't care what you call them. And I think that's okay. Um, so we have planted it, we pruned it back, and now we're in our first summer for these berries. So we are talking about flora cane varieties, and we are talking about right now our semi erect or erect blackberries, more upright growth. What we're going to do is we're going to tip the canes when they're eight to 12 inches above the top trellis wire. So depending on semi-erect, we're doing anywhere about three feet and above. On erect blackberries, we can grow them a little bit taller. They're a little more vigorous, a little more upright. It might be four to five feet tall. The reason we're topping them is the same exact reason we top limbs on an apple tree. If you remember when we make a heading back cut, we're removing that very end growth bud that's producing the hormone oxen. That oxen flow makes those buds remain dormant and not grow. If we prune it out, we suddenly get more growth. Same exact thing is happening here. By pruning this, we're getting more lateral or side branching on these plants because that's where we're gonna have our most fruit. We don't want a 15 foot tall cane we want a shorter cane with a lot of side branching because it's the side branching is where we're going to find our flowers. That's where we're going to find the fruit. And so that's why we do this. We actually do want to do this by hand if we can. So if you've ever looked closely at berry plants when they're young like this, when they're lush growth, they're not very woody on those topmost parts. You do probably want to wear a leather glove unless you're really tough, uh, but you're going to want to go through and it's actually very easy just to take your fingers and snap them. Snapping is preferred over cutting. And so some of this is timing thing. You can't just do this once unless maybe you just have one or two plants there, uh, but you'll want to do this several trips because not every cane grows at exactly the same rate. Some buds break before others. So you're going to do this a few times, but just do it whenever they're still able to be broke. If you happen to miss some and you have to use uh, some sort of pruners, that's okay. But it's actually a little bit better to do it by hand. Uh, we actually get a smaller wound. It heals over better because it kind of breaks at a natural point for itself. So that's why we like to do it by hand. But again, it encourages that lateral branching or those side branches that give us the fruit. 
So what about our more trailing blackberries? What do we do with them? Well, we actually don't prune these, so they do grow a little bit different. And so we have a couple of options. So uh, you see their images, one from uh, a North Carolina state resource, the other from uh, University of Georgia. And they're both depicting kind of a little bit different way to do it. And they're both correct. There's not a right or wrong. So the top one is where we don't prune anything. We just kind of weave those canes among our horizontal wires. So up and down, up and down. The other option is we just don't do anything at all. And then we do what we see in the bottom during the dormant season. So we come back and tie those up into a fan pattern because you're going to have some that are longer, some that are shorter. So you'll kind of get a little bit of natural spacing like that. And you can see there you actually have three wires horizontally in that case instead of just two. Either way can work. There's not a right or wrong to it. But again, we don't do a tremendous amount of pruning on these during that first summer. Uh, we could always maybe tip some things if they're growing really aggressively and just getting out of hand for the space we have. But by and large, we're not going to prune these in summer. For our raspberry flora cane, again, flora cane meaning that they bl uh, bloom and produce berries in year two of life. We are looking at basically doing the similar practice we saw with our erect and semi-erect blackberries. You notice the heights are different. Black raspberries are not as large of a plant as erect blackberries. So we're only talking about 24 to 30 inches. So that means if we're talking about trellising and you have different kinds of berries in your patch, I would try to stick like berries together because I'm gonna have different wire heights on my trellis. And so that way you don't have black raspberries either way under a wire or you don't have uh, the erect black, uh, but, erect blackberries way above a wire. So do think about if you have different ones, what height of wire you might need. Purple raspberries are again, um, a little bit more vigorous. So we can go a little bit higher with those. Red and yellow fruited raspberries, uh, they should not be topped. Um, and I will say that red and yellow fruited raspberries are not the best choice for our area. Raspberries actually as a whole like cooler conditions. So I actually in a little bit have a, a graphic from Iowa, I think it is, uh, as an example, how we can manage red raspberries. But it's neat if you go looking for great pictures for things like red raspberries, you find them in places like South Dakota and other places like that. Their universities are turning out some really good materials. And it's because it's superbly suited to their area. They don't love our hot humid summers. So just be aware if you really want raspberries, the black and purple are probably going to be our better bets. Doesn't mean you can't grow red and yellow. It just means if you ask me which one would I more likely have an easier time with, it's going to be black and purple. Well, Ray, I mean, mm -hmm. not a question, but I've grown a few times carrot Yep. Red raspberries. Yep. And there's some kind of a wasp or something to lay an egg in there that Okay. The thing that pops to my mind with Barry, so there was a question about some insect pests that he had seen on some uh, red raspberries, uh, heritage raspberries he had grown. There's the spotted wing Drosophila that can attack any of our fruit. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that pops in my mind. I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. It, the, there are some borers. Yeah. There are some borers that can attack. Yeah. And it may be that the red raspberries are more attractive to them. Yeah. Um, that is... Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. you got to break that thing off, which is popping up and showing up. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just going yeah, so that may be another, they may be more attractive to that insect pest. So when we're doing our summer tipping, so for our blackberries, for uh, the purple and black raspberries, we would like to do this uh, when it's not wet and when it's not expected to rain or we're not expected to have real heavy dews because we do have open wounds and we do want to be aware that when we have wet conditions, cane blight in, in particular 
can be easily spread through those open wounds and wet conditions. So if we have the option and we can pay a little bit of attention to uh, the forecast or if we're irrigating anything, uh, take advantage of dry conditions to do that tipping. Uh, now, again, it's not where it's a one and done. So there might be some scenarios where sometimes you have great window for tipping in regards to moisture and other times you don't. Just do the best you can and be aware of it. And also be on the lookout if you do it during unfavorable conditions and you start seeing uh, the disease, then that might be a time to think about removing some of those canes so it doesn't spread. So what about subsequent summer pruning? Basically, for our primocane fruiters, we do exactly what we did the first year. For the flora canes, about the only thing we would do differently is if we have canes that are already fruited, we're going to remove those. So we can actually, some of our earlier varieties that fruit earlier in the season, we can go ahead and remove those even though we're in the growing period. One of the reasons we want to do that is they are older. They might be 18 months old at that point or something like that, or, or 19 months. Older materials typically have higher levels of disease. It could be carrying insects. So by removing those early in the cycle, we can actually sometimes short circuit disease spread. So it's not a bad idea to look at removing those soon after harvest. Because again, with flora canes, that cane is two years old. It's fruited and that's it, it's done. It's just gonna die. So there's nothing wrong with removing it once it's no longer useful for us in production. Dormant pruning. So basically this time of year, and certainly this week is a nice week to be doing some pruning. Um, when we're looking at our erect and semi-erect blackberries, if we haven't removed those dead flora canes during the growing season uh, in the past time, go ahead and do it in the dormant season because we need to get those out of there. They're not helping anything. And they'll just be a source potentially for diseases and even insects to live on. What we want to do, and remember, we had tipped these in summer when they reached the height we wanted. Now we're going to go back and we are going to reduce or prune the side branches that grow. So you can see there, we have plants that we tipped. We have a lot of side branching, nice long growth. We're going to cut most of that off or at least cut it back to 12 to 18 inches in length. The reason we're doing that is we want good air and sunlight penetration, kind of like what we do on fruit trees where we limit some of the growth. Uh, and so we cut those back. Also, if we have any side branches very close to the ground, we can remove those. So if you're not at least, you know, 12 to 18 inches above the ground, go ahead and cut them off. The other thing we can do, we're going to have more canes there than we need. And we're going to remove the ones that are weak. So keep in mind, this is this time of year. So what we have left over, first we remove everything that was dead last year. So we have basically mature wood on these flora canes now that's going to produce our fruit. What we're going to have coming on as we grow into summer is our new primocanes. So next year's fruiting crop. So we're going to thin these about four to six per linear foot of row. And the reason we do that is we need room in there for all the new canes that are going to pop up. So when we're done, it looks like that picture there on the right. We've got much shorter side branches and we have much or several fewer canes actually growing. You might think, wow, I just removed a lot of stuff. Yes, but you're going to have a bunch of new canes popping up out of the ground. So that's why we thin these aggressively is not only do we have our fruiting canes there, we have our vegetative canes, our prima canes getting ready to pop out of the ground and they need room too. We don't want to have too dense of a growth area simply because we need airflow. The wetter things are, the more diseases we have. So we do want to make sure that we are thinning these. And what we're also doing is we're reducing the load on our production system. There's only so many nutrients and water within the given footprint of your row. And the more plants you have trying to grab it, the less there is to go around. So I'd rather you have fewer larger berries than a whole bunch of little tiny berries that you spend all day trying to pick. So this is how we get those nice large berries that we don't typically find often in the wild grown circumstances. That's why, you know, finding uh, a 
cultivated blackberry, especially with some varieties, that's the size of my thumb, is easy to do if you're doing things like this. And it's because you're creating conditions that cause that to happen. So doing these steps is going to give us a better harvest from a quality standpoint. Likewise, with our black and purple raspberries, we are being uh, basically mimicking what we just did. Numbers are a little bit different. Again, these plants are a little less vigorous than blackberries, so our numbers are a little bit smaller. We're pruning a little bit shorter on those side branches. Again, kind of proportional to their overall growth. And then again, we're thinning and the same exact reason. So for fluorocane varieties, we're actually looking at very similar practices. We don't make a lot of changes. So what about our red and yellow raspberries? This is the Iowa State image I found that I liked. We basically go in one, we remove dead fluorocanes, if not already done, so same thing. The other thing that we sometimes see with these, and especially because when grown in, in uh, more harsh winter areas, winter injury can sometimes be a problem with these. So if you have winter injury on these, you want to cut that back to live tissue on the individual canes. Depending how severe it is, you may remove the entire cane. But then we basically do the same practice. We thin them. So we actually go through, we're about putting six inches between each cane in the row. And because these grow a little bit differently, we're more likely to see root suckers on these than some of the blackberries. We kind of maintain a width of bed. Um, if you've ever seen uh, blackberries growing for years, they're not quite as hedgy looking as raspberries will be. And so because of that, we don't necessarily um, see this same exact look in blackberries. But in raspberries like this, we actually do want to make sure we're limiting that. Because of root suckers, you will have them popping up on the sides. Again, that's a scenario where you might be able to move those to somewhere else, give them away uh, to someone. Uh, but certainly you want to try to control that with the bed, keep it about two feet. Again, a lot of it has to do with sunlight and air penetration uh, into our uh, fruit patch. Uh, and so do consider that whenever you're looking at raspberries. Yes. If, if you can just cut it down at the ground surface, that's a good question uh, because you might get more growth later, but uh, it would be new vegetative growth. So it might make sense to have like a trowel or a spade or something and pop it up. If you see a crown growing there, especially if you've seen hayway and saying we've had one popping up there before, you might be able to dig out that crown, uh, but you can certainly cut them off at the ground and see how far that gets you. And it's also one of those things, something like that, where it's something you're completely removing because it's overgrowing the bed. If you're going through there in the middle of summer and you see one starting, you can do it then. You don't have to wait. Uh, until winter to do that necessarily. Because again, it, it's a little bit different whenever you're removing something that's not going to be productive. So those were all about fluoracanes. And so again, we're managing that because we don't get fruit on that growth until year two. Primacanes, very different. These are the ones that in year one, late in the season, we get fruit. So basically what we have to decide is do we only want that late summer fall crop or do we want the fall crop and then the summer crop next year? There isn't a right or wrong, but generally speaking, fall crops are better and they're the larger of the two. So because of that, many people do drift towards fall crop only. And you might see why when you look at what pruning we have to do. So again, these are sometimes referred to as summer fruiting. Everbearing is another term often applied to these. Um, and as far as I know, that is not applied to anything other than the primocane fruiting on these cane berries. So blackberries and raspberries, if we're doing a fall crop only, and we are treating these the same, in summer, basically we kind of do the same sort of thing, but a little different. So we are going to be tipping these about three feet tall. We do want to maintain a row width about 18 inches. So these are going to be more hedgy uh, than what we would see with normal blackberries. We get our primocane harvest. 
And then late in the season or as we're getting into the dormant season, we just cut everything down. A lot of people just take a push mower and just push it over the road. Works great. That's your pruning. And then you gather it up and get it out of there. Don't leave the material sitting there. And certainly you could do it by hand. You could use a hedge clipper or anything like that. Uh, they're a little bit woody, but they're not ginormously large. That's all you've got to do. Cut them, get them out of there. And then next spring, your new primacanes grow, which in this case is actually your fruiting cane. And so that's why a lot of people say, hey, I can just do a fall crop basically not have a ton to do it works well and it's a good quality crop typically yes you know, say something about our experience and how it relates back and forth to sure industries. we've only put in primal cane uh primal cane raspberries and it does really well yeah so, um, the only thing is you have to watch too much water in this area true uh, because they get root disease and they've lost a lot and we've had them start bearing in June and we're all bearing in yeah. uh, some of them in our hoop house in November. Awesome. So we've gotten really good at it. Yeah, plenty of water and putting frost. Uh, so what we've had is a few comments from the audience of folks that have been growing some of the primacane fruiters. Some of them are seeing a harvest all the way from June, basically, until frost. Uh, they do caution. They've seen some disease problems when they've had wetter seasons or wet areas. If you know you have a soil that doesn't allow drainage great, one of the things we can do is plant on a mound. So actually plant on a raised bed, you get better drainage. And so that's something we do almost routinely for uh, blueberries because they're very sensitive to wet roots. Uh, so, uh, but that is something to be aware of. If you don't have the best conditions, sometimes we can ameliorate those with how we plant things. So, yes. How high would the mound be on that? Are we talking three inches, six inches? Uh... Three to six inches would work well. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to, the, the challenge we get into with using, it's slightly off topic, sorry, but the challenge we get into with planting on mounds is the larger and taller we make it, the more we have to water it. So there's always kind of a happy medium of three to six inches gives us a basically gravity has greater influence on the flow of water in that soil, but because it is raised, it's a little bit warmer. It's a little bit more exposed to wind. So it dries out a little faster. So, you know, lots of times I would say we don't necessarily have to worry about irrigation with uh, our berries. Doesn't mean there aren't years where it's going to be a big boon to us if we have it. Uh, but it's not necessarily a necessity, but the larger uh, raised mound we do, the more important irrigation will become, especially in drier periods. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, that's one of the trade-offs. It's the same thing kind of with raised beds. A lot of people like raised beds for vegetable gardens, but we water them more frequently than if they were in the ground. Uh, and so just kind of count the costs on that and figure out what's most appropriate for your operation. Yes. So uh, what I'm understanding is these berries, uh, they're kind of like grapes. Uh, they like it drier versus wet feet, correct? Correct. And virtually most of our plants that we grow in gardens or in orchards, almost nothing likes wet feet except for the few boggy type plants that we seek out for like ornamental purposes. Roots have to have oxygen is, is the short answer on why. Uh, and because of that, waterlogged conditions, wet conditions lead to root death or uh, easier penetration by different diseases. Uh, and so wet conditions are bad. So it's always one of those things you're looking at planting something if you have an area that stays wet for several days you know the ground is squishy and soggy after a good rain that's probably not the best area to be planting most things if you look closely what you think is grass might not actually be grass it may be some different sorts of weeds some of which look grassy but they're not your fescue it's not your uh, typical grass species there because they can't handle wet conditions even so it's interesting that we can have little microclimates uh, even in our yard and garden that may make something better or worse for that location. So what if we did want to get that second crop, if we did want to look at having uh, year two harvest on primacanes? 
Well, again, we start out, we do that soft summer tip about three feet tall. We get our fall harvest or late summer, however you want to reference it. And then what we do is we go in during the dormant period and we remove the dead portions that fruited last year. So the top of that primocane fruited, that top part's going to die. So you go in, prune it out. The other thing you can do is remove, again, wheat cane. So we're thinning our canes again, just like we did on flora cane. And then that next summer, we have that summer crop. Uh, and again, we can remove those early as soon as they're done fruiting uh, to save work later and to remove any disease potential. So basically, the only added step for a double crop on primocane is we go in and cut off the tips uh, after we get our first harvest. That's about the only added step versus a floricane. Otherwise, we're virtually doing the same thing as we do with the floricane varieties. So again, it's not that we can't do a second crop, but certainly a lot of people like the ease of a single crop and particularly when we have uh, folks in our area that are growing them and are getting the long harvest window especially if you start looking at different varieties so you don't plant only a single variety of these primocane fruiter there are some that are earlier some that are later and that's a very good way to extend your harvest season is to plant different maturity varieties whether we're talking about vegetables or fruits by having things that come to fruit earlier middle and late we are extending that season and so that can be a great way to get that longer harvest period too Now, I know that's drinking from a fire hose, but one, I think there's good resources uh, when you get that list, and there'll be a link at the end that you'll see for those here in person. Um, next, we're going to jump to grapes. Uh, so here's our second fire hose of the evening. Um, grapes are one that I'm personally less familiar with. Uh, and part of it is a lot of my exposure to grapes at a professional level has been more uh, associated with some wine grapes and basically that's a lot more complicated than what we do in our backyards and that's a good thing. So I think this is going to be as straightforward as possible. Uh, you may still have questions and you all know reach out to me with questions. Look at the resources. I think I found some really good resources with some great pictures that really helped me better understand it and I hope you all walk away feeling better about it too. I'm going to try to get these terms correct. Uh, and I say that because we have some terms that we see from other pruning tasks or other pruning species. Um, so we have things such as a trunk, and that's our main upright structure of the grapevine. We have a cane that is a green summer shoot that hardens off into a woody brown one-year-old cane. Um, we have a cordon. These are the permanent uh, extension of the grapevine's trunk horizontally. You can kind of think of these as branches if we're thinking analogous to a tree. We've got fruiting wood, which is one-year-old wood that produces the current season shoots, and that's where the flowers happen. And then renewal spurs and spurs, again, kind of very similar to what we think of as spurs on a fruit tree in that they're short little branches for an analogy. Um, or a cane, you could even say, uh, that allow us to have shoots and then fruit clusters. So I'll try to use these correctly and just know that this reference is here. I don't know that I put this reference in the PDF, uh, just because I think those are the only thing I borrowed from the Ohio State publication. But if you Google that, you should be able to find it if you want to look at that further. One thing important about grapes, you know, one of the big things is when do we do our pruning? And so basically one thing we have to be aware of is one plant response, especially with grapes, is when we prune, we are hastening bud break or growth. So we wouldn't want to be out there if we can help at pruning our grapes in January. So waiting until March is not a bad thing. So these could be one of the last things we might get around to pruning in the backyard. Uh, we do want to get to them before bud break. And so I borrowed this from University of Georgia. Uh, you see dormant buds on the left illustration and you see a bud that is beginning to break there on the right. 
So we do want to get this accomplished before we get to bud break. Um, but uh, again, this is something that happens later. Uh, and so we don't want to be too early uh, if we can at all help it, because we can encourage those to grow early, which means they'd be more susceptible to our seasonal spring frost, which we don't want to have happen. So I love this uh, quote. Uh, uh, it was from actually a, a article or a blog posting that was entitled, Don't Be Timid When Pruning Grapes. And I think this is a very key thing about pruning grapes. And so the quote is, home grape growers don't prune their vines enough. When gardeners prune, they should remove the majority of wood produced the previous season until about 90% is pruned off. That's pretty darn remarkable. I don't know many other plants that we prune 90% off routinely. Now, maybe if we're rejuvenating something or whatever, but even in the ornamental world, pruning off 90% is pretty dramatic for something that is perennial or something that is woody. So the question is, why, why or how do we get away with this? And our master gardeners that are online, I know there's a few, I'd expect them to get this question right. It all goes back to where does fruiting occur on this plant? Hopefully it's intuitive for some of you that have been through like master gardeners and had botany, that if you're cutting off 90% of growth, it wasn't on last year's growth that we have the flower buds. Because like on most fruit trees, for instance, all the ones I'm familiar with that come to my mind right now, I'm probably forgetting the exception. Somebody might know it in the comment section, but they fruit on last year's wood. So when they're actually forming fruit this year and filling that fruit, they're also forming the fruit buds for next year. That's how we get biennial bearing on apple trees where we have a ginormous fruit load this year. So it's sending all its resources to the fruit and the seeds and just a little bit to the flowers. And the next year you have barely any fruit. Well, because you have no fruit being filled, now you have a ton of flowers being produced that year. And so the subsequent year, we have a giant fruit load again. And it's a self-repeating biennial cycle of boom and bust, essentially. You don't get that with grapes because they don't grow flowers off of last year's wood. It's the new shoots that grow. And so it's the current year's growth. So this is more akin to some of our uh, ornamental plants. If you have hydrangeas, especially if you have different kinds of hydrangea, you know, it's important to remember which one's fruit on new wood or the current season growth and which one's fruit on last year's growth. Because if you get it wrong, you can cut off this year's flowers. It might be a problem if your wife really likes the hydrangeas. So we back want to up, make sure we... The so the hydrangeas, so hydrangeas are complicated because we have multiple species of hydrangeas. Some of them are flowering on new growth. So it's growth that doesn't exist this time of year on the bush. So if we go out there and hack it to the ground, if we wanted to, we could still get flowers this year because it's coming off the new growth. It may be delayed if we remove all the growth, but we can get new flowers. Other hydrangeas, they formed those flower buds last fall. So if they make it through winter without being killed, if we go in there and cut them off now, we cut off the flowers for this year. And it's all about where are those flower buds are? Is it on current season's growth or why are they formed last year? And the reason we can cut these so severely and should cut these so severely is because it's the new growth that has the flower buds. And so that's why this is so dramatic, especially in the fruit world to me, is we don't have this on a lot of other things. That's because other fruits are setting fruits on last year's wood. So that's why the difference. So when we do a really good job, we can get some things like this happening. So this is a nice, well-spaced, well-pruned uh, grape. And I think this is perfectly achievable for the backyard. Uh, and we'll talk about how we get there. Uh, this one is a cordon train. It happens to be a Merlot, which is a wine grape, but it doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, this is kind of a good example of what you would hope to get. And your new growth that you're going to get there, that you see it's green, that's where you're also going to start getting your fruit clusters. That's where flowers happen. So that's why we can trim like this. The woodier portions that are very dark, larger, and woody, they don't make flowers. They make shoots that you see there, but it's on the shoots that we get the flowers. 
And so that's why we prune grapes the way we do. And so it's just important to understand this is a little bit different than some of our other fruits. So the big thing about pruning grapes is there's basically two methods to it. There's more than two methods to it if we want to be technical. We're not going to get technical. We're going to be straightforward. So we're going to look at cane pruning and spur pruning. They're not that different, really. And in fact, we can convert from one to the other if the need arises. We typically do see cane pruning more for uh, our um, American varieties like Concords and others. Uh, and basically, it's just that as these grow naturally, they are more fruitful further away from the trunk or from the base. And so because of that, we grow them in a particular way. We have longer canes that are left for fruiting, and canes are only cut short to rejuvenate it. And, so, and basically, that's to make a cane for next year. Spur pruning is where we establish essentially those cordons. So this would also be called cordon pruning. So a lot of people, if you've seen pictures of wine grape production, you'll see cordons. And there's a host of different ways of doing cordons. We're gonna look at a simple direct way. We, so we see this more often if you have some of the like French hybrid grapes, or if you do have some of the wine type grapes, you're more likely to do this method. And basically you don't have long canes, you have more or less permanently, that's kind of subjective, but permanently uh, established branches or cordons that all your shoots are arising from. And you basically have very short little canes, spurs. That's why we call this spur pruning. So if we think about fruiting spurs on apple trees, there are those little branches that are bearing those fruit buds. Basically the same idea, these spurs grow the shoots and the shoots have the fruit buds. So not totally dissimilar, some basic uh, similarities with some of our other pruning, but also different. So what do we do at planting? If we've got a new planting of a grape, basically, and even this, you can find differences of suggestions, but most often you'll see recommended that you basically cut that uh, grape back to just a single shoot with about three buds on it. So kind of similar to what we do with our brambles where we want good vegetative growth. That's what we're establishing by doing this. Once we get those buds to break and it's growing, when they're about a foot tall, we go out there and we pick one of those new shoots to be our trunk. And so what that means is we're going to actually tie it to a stake loosely, kind of at the bottom and at the top. I have seen where a lot of people, when they're trying to train something, and this goes back to training on fruit trees, uh, we're not actually pruning it. We're just trying to train it in the way we want it to go. You're not trying to tie it down to a gurney so you can go 85 miles an hour down the highway. All you're trying to do is loosely support this so there's still movement, but that it's able to stay upright. Mm -hmm. So don't think that we've got to duct tape this sucker to a bamboo pole to where it will not move. That's not the goal. Movement is not a bad thing for plants. With woody trees, if you stake a tree where it will not wiggle and move, I can guarantee you it's going to fail because that movement actually encourages more rooting. It encourages a more stout trunk even. So don't think we have to crank these suckers down to where they can't move. We just want to support their growth and minimize and limit the growth and move, well, movement rather that happens because we're going to have wind. We're going to have things like that. Uh, grow tubes. Uh, it's not uncommon, especially for commercial vineyards. They are buying grapes that come with a grow tube, which is basically a plastic tube that they will keep on that plant for first year at least. Uh, and so that does give it some physical protection. If you have deer or something like that, it's not a bad thing to have around. I'm not saying you have to have grow tubes, uh, but you do see those and, and they're not a bad thing. And that kind of, again, acts as a little corral for it or uh, a, a structure that helps support the growth. I doubt our, I, generally they are kind of a, a whitish or a, uh, translucent plastic because you do want as much light to get through as you can. I think generally they might be a polycarbonate material or similar plastic to that. Um, I don't know that you could find those locally at any of our garden centers. I've seen where, you know, a vineyard is being planted like at a commercial scale 
and they come in on some of the vines. So it may be when you buy it, you have the option to get that. You know, the internet, we can find everything. So uh, certainly if you started looking grow tubes for grapes, you could probably find one. I have a question. Okay. We've talked about my grapevine, which is old. Yep. It was 75 years old, it's growing on a chicken house. I built a trellis yep. so that it, they would hang down. I, I didn't put the wire up the mm -hmm. post across the top. Would it be okay to go ahead and take a cutting off, off of the grape now and prove it? I think so. You're so uh, we got a question. He's got a long, old, established grapevine. He's thinking about taking some cuttings and rooting them. Grapes actually do root well from cuttings. I do think dormant cuttings are how we do that with grapes. I'd have to look up to be certain just because I don't trust my memory anymore. Uh, but yes. And, and so sometimes if you have something that's really established and it's going completely the wrong direction, or you're like, I want to do something different sometimes it's better to start over and you actually get better results faster by doing that. And so um, remind me, holler at me, call me at the office uh, and I'll double check. But and yes. Just cut it off the tip of the vine. Well, we'd want to have a good node. So a node is where we have uh, leaves uh, coming from, for instance. So it might be I come out and we figure out some options. Okay. That might be the best way. Uh, and then I get to hopefully be outside on a pretty day instead yeah. of in front of a computer in the office. <laughs> Do call me. Um, okay, so back to this. But good, good interruption. Good question. Um, so we do tie it loosely. We do want to support that growth. We do want to encourage it to grow upright because basically we are dealing with a vine. Vines don't just naturally want to stand up on their own. So we do have to encourage it. So that's why staking, grow tubes, things like that are something you're going to want to look at accomplishing. As it grows during the summer, we are going to tie it additionally as needed. Again, we want some movement, so don't tie it too tight. Yes? Are grapes a plant that needs a lot of sun? Excellent question. So grapes do need a lot of sun. So uh, we can sometimes find wild grapes and things like that in uh, forest. Uh, if you see grapevines hanging down, normally you don't see leaves until you look way up in the canopy. So grapes try to grow to light, like when if they're in a light deprived state. But basically anything that we're growing in our gardens is going to be benefited by full sun. Unless we're talking about some ornamentals that specifically uh, are needing uh, less sun or shade conditions. So most things that we grow, we get more production, the more sun. Because, of course, sun powers all the uh, food production within that plant. So good question. And in fact, sometimes that's what we want to look at whenever we're opening up trees or, or even vines. Sometimes it's if we prune in the wrong manner, we create conditions that shade lower branches and things like that. That's not good. So we can actually, even if we have a sunny location, create situations where shade becomes a problem. So that is something to think about. Uh, and especially with um, trellis and arbor designs, there are a lot of interesting designs sometimes trying to get maximum uh, light uh, interception by those leaves. So V trellises, double V trellises, all sorts of things. Very interesting to look at. Probably more than we need in the backyard garden though often. Let's say we have a scenario where, okay, we've tried this and it's just not growing well the first year. We, we got some growth, but it's not growing much. Probably just want to go back that next dormant season start over. So cut back to a couple of buds and start over. What's good about doing that, we now have a root system that's grown for a year. So that second year of doing this, we're almost guaranteed we're going to get the growth we want, unless there's a real serious problem somewhere. But in, uh, it's very important that we have a good sound trunk because depending which method we go with, this is going to be the really true perennial part of our grapevine. So we need it to be good and sound and what we're looking for so that we have success for years down the road. If it's not doing well, I would much rather pause for one year, get that right, and then move forward and get this wrong and always be chasing it because it's a problem. The first dormant season, so basically this time of year or 
later, I'd probably say March, early March for our area is probably when I would try to target this. Doesn't mean we can't do it earlier, uh, but certainly we don't want to be too early with this. We basically kind of have three scenarios and we have to evaluate what has happened. So we can have where our trunk just reaches our bottom wire, not a problem. We tie that trunk to the bottom wire and then we just snip the top bud off. Same exact thing we've been doing all the time when we remove the apical or the top bud, we want lateral growth. If there are any laterals present, we're gonna prune those off because we want new vigorous growth. We don't want woody material on that trunk. If the trunk was vigorous, we have good growth. It's up above the bottom wire. We'll cut it back to about four to five inches, bend it down and tie it to the wire as if it were a cordon. Even if we're not exactly doing a cordon growth, we're basically doing the same practice. If we have laterals, other side branches, we remove those. Let's say we got a really vigorous plant. It established quickly. We had a great season. We have a lot of growth. We have a ton of side branches. If we have good side branching and they are near enough to that bottom wire, we can go ahead use those side branches to establish our cordons or canes, either one. And we're going to prune those back to three to five buds. And then we're going to actually top uh, that trunk just above the wire. Because basically we had such good growth, we're kind of ahead of schedule in this scenario. So let's put a picture to that. It's not the greatest picture, but it is, I think, a worthwhile picture is this. So those are those scenarios. You kind of have less growth, but you've reached your wire. You have more growth. So you have enough to start training it on the, along that wire horizontally, or you have a lot of growth. So you've got the opportunity to really move forward with establishing either the cordons or the canes that you want to grow. And so any of these is acceptable. Obviously, the third C is you're a little further along. Some varieties are more vigorous growers than others. So just because you see some differences among different varieties, if you have more than one variety, that doesn't mean you've got a bad plant or a plant that's not doing well. It's just not everything grows at the same rate. So don't be discouraged. Any of these are acceptable and good. The first two years we're growing great finds. We are very happy to just be establishing and building that structure. So don't think if we don't have results C, we've got a, a losing proposition on our hands. Not, a, not true at all. So our second year dormant pruning. So basically we've reached that point and so they've grown all season long. So then what do we do? If we have canes that are well formed, if we're doing cane pruning, we're basically looking at, do we have canes that are about three to five foot in length? And is it a little bit larger than a pencil in diameter up to about three eighths inch? So we're wanting some decent size on these and we can use these to start establishing that structure. And so again, we may, this could be in year two, it might be year three, depending on the plant. And just keep in mind, we do talk about with grapes, tying uh, these canes or vines to the trellis. Uh, you can't rely on a grape just to hold itself there well, especially when they're starting to get fruiting weight on them. So you do actually wanna be tying these. So that brings us to, okay, we've reached a point to where we're gonna start doing our permanent, our established growth. We're ready to go. So how do we do that? We've got these two options, cane pruning and spur pruning. So to start with, we'll look at cane pruning. So first off, this is just a visual of the difference between the two. And so let me bring up my pointer tool. All right. So we have our spur on this side. And so here we have our trunk. Then we have the cordon. Both of those are older. They are perennial. We keep them there. What we have here vertically upright, kind of the knobby looking things, 
are actually spurs. This is the spurs that was mentioned. And so we basically have shoots arising from those each year. On the cane type, you'll notice we don't have woody cordons growing here. And this that I'm tracing right now is actually two years old. But now that we're in the dormant season, we're actually going to be removing that. So what we had fruiting was the one year growth. So basically everything that's growing up like this was growing and fruiting. Same thing over here. We had one year growth coming from the spurs, growing up and fruiting. They're accomplishing the same thing. Just on the spur type, we've established basically a permanent cordon or branch, if you will, that then has spurs that grow the shoots. And on the cane, we grow these canes that are growing the shoots. That's the difference. And some uh, varieties prefer one to the other, but truthfully, uh, either one can be acceptable. So cane pruning. So this is one that last year we had established our first canes. That is the horizontal runs that we see on the bottom wire. So all this upright vertical growth is one year old. The horizontal is two years old. And then we have our trunk. If you look closely at the trunk, this is a double trunk. We didn't talk about that. You can have double trunks. We're going to simplify it and not talk about it, but it does exist. But literally, it's just two trunks. So instead of having a cane going left and a cane going right, it just goes one direction because you have two trunks. Some people like to do this because if there's some sort of problem, insect disease in your trunk and you have one, you lose the whole grape or can lose the whole grape. If you have two, maybe you have one survive. Again, generally in a backyard scenario, I think one's acceptable. If you want to be more risk averse and do two trunks, just duplicate everything I said to do, do it twice. So you have two selected shoots that you're growing upright. Uh, but otherwise, everything else is very similar. Okay. Yes. Uh, so is that where you got the trunk there? Yep. And year after year, you'd be kind of having a, a two year horizontal, yep, horizontal, and then a one, one year vertical. Now, so what happened is this so the year prior, so let's say this is March and we're pruning it here. So we're coming in here. And so last March, when we were done pruning, we had the two horizontals and then we had some short spurs that we purposely left down here around this area. And a short spur is just where we take one of these canes, we cut it back to about three buds or so. Mm -hmm. The reason we did that, we knew next year we're going to need these horizontal canes again. So we purposely wanted it or, uh, originating down here, not up here off of a two-year-old piece of wood. So we purposely wanted to have some originating here. You'll hear this area referred to as like the head. Uh, again, don't have to be that complicated. It's just the top of the trunk. Will that become another horizontal next year? I, I will show you. I will show you. So this is, we walk into our vineyard March, let's say March 1st. We're just like, okay, we got to get this prepared for this season. So what we do is we basically remove 90% of the growth. Remember what we're doing? So we remove every horizontal. So we move both horizontals. I'm not sure this is the same exact grape. So if you're like that, those trunks look different. I agree, they do. I think they had a blurry photo or something like that. I've done this before when you're trying to track something, something goes wrong with the photo. So you just get the closest thing you can. So don't let that throw you. The principles are the same. What happened to the horizontal? It had horizontals. They were pruned off. Why? Because we don't need them. They had their fun in the sun. We don't retain them. This is cane pruning. We do not have permanently established horizontals. What we left are some shoots that we had left as spurs, specifically because we knew this March, we need to have new horizontals. So then what we would do is, okay, we need a right, we need a left, and we do that. 
if you look closely, do you see how there's like a little stub here and a little stub here? Those are spurs. They left to grow next year's horizontals. Because again, what's going to happen? There's a bud. It's going up. That's where we're going to get our shoot and our fruit. There's a bud. It's going up. Or maybe that's it. Maybe. Well, what do you do with that? What do you do with that next year? That's the, whole the next year we go back to that, and those little stubs we left just now will be these tall ones we see here that we bend down and tie. So every year we go through this process. March 1st, we walk in there, we see the mess. We take out everything almost that grew last year, except for a couple we turn into our horizontals and we leave a couple of spurs, little nubbins, to grow next year's horizontals. Every year you're going to have a new horizontal. Every year you're going to have a new horizontal. That's what cane pruning is. Hey, it's just great nice if you have another layer. So you can, it, it's possible to do lower wires and higher wires. You can do that. They do that a lot with some uh, wine grapes. You have double cordons and you can actually have your trunk in the middle and it kind of splits off as a V and you have a right and a left curtain and that's all complicated. And so this is a more practical, easily accomplished home approach and it, it, it works i mean and, and that's it this it's not saying that we couldn't do and you can see those upper wires there are more to help control that new growth so it doesn't fall out splay out everywhere so this is one approach and especially for things like concord this is probably the better approach for them yeah my concord looks more like the Example of the spur. So I've got a time for it. I'm trying to turn French and it needs to, it needs to restart or something. Okay. So basically we had a comment that they have a concord that looks like spur type, and I'm telling them you should do it cane. We'll actually have an example here in a second mm -hmm. where they're rejuvenating mm -hmm. a spur type by making it a cane type. It'll make sense when you see pictures, I promise. Okay. So what about the other one? Okay. The big difference, it has permanently established horizontal cordons. That's the difference. What we do is so all this wood here that we see more or less upright, last year's growth, our horizontal, our trunk, we know it's older. It's woody. It's got that shaggy bark look to it. Obvious. We know it's older. So what we do we prune back our spurs. Our spurs are perennial. They're going to stay there. We don't cut them off. We cut them back to three to five buds maybe every year. So every year we're going to have new growth coming up here because that's right here. And actually there's one there and there's one there. There's one here. There's one here. There's one here. Every year we're going to have those coming back because remember earlier, the very first compare and contrast picture between the two, that spur type on the right had really big gnarly looking triangles on its cord. Those were spurs that had been there for years because every year they stay there. Now we can have a problem. And that kind of goes back to the question we had about well, what if we've been going the wrong direction or if we want to change directions. But you can see the basic principle is you remove almost everything because we have our permanently established horizontals and we're just cutting it back to a few buds and that's it. So it's really not, to me, spur is super easy because it basically anything new you cut off almost completely. And then that's it. You don't have to tie a new thing down. You don't have to do stuff like that. But that's not to say that spur is better. It's just different. Again, here's that comparison. So I should have flipped slides. Here we have these gnarly old spurs that have been established for multiple seasons. But yet you still see we've got good new growth going up. You will note here, we've got a blank spot. We didn't get growth last year from that spur. Maybe disease, maybe a physical wound, something happened. Eh, if it's one on there, we're not worried about it. If half of those are gone, we've got a problem because now we've lost half of our new growth, which means we don't have flowers produced. 
So that's where we can actually do some remediation. So can we, and this is that example I was talking about. So let's say you've got something that looks like it has established cordon and you say, uh-oh, I want to do this as a cane. How do I convert it? How do I go back? So the blue arrow is saying, this is going to be our new cane for cane pruning, even though we have a cord in there. In this specific example, you can see from this point to this point, we have absolutely no fruiting growth on there. So we are wasting our time. We're wasting space and time and everything else on that plant. So we need to rejuvenate it. So to do that, we basically just go back to what we did to start in the first place. You create a cane, you establish it. Doggone, did I not put that one in there? I didn't. Okay, so, so basically, and I can't believe I left that picture out. I'll have to fix that whenever I go to put the slides out to everybody because it's dramatic, but it's great. So we say this blue one here that we've selected is our new cane. So what do we do on cane pruning? We cut everything off but our new cane. So what we would literally do is we would leave a couple of small spurs here to create next year's new canes, new horizontals. Everything else comes off, including this horizontal here, because it's basically half dead to us. It's not working. We then bring that blue one down and tie it. And then next year, we've got the choice. Is that now our new permanent established cordon? Or do we go, do we keep doing cane pruning where we would bring down the next cane next year and tie it down. So if we're trying to rejuvenate this cordon and make a new one, well, then we just treat it like a spur pruning. And we cut back to short spurs and we leave the horizontal alone. If we decided, no, I went the wrong direction. I've turned this into a spur pruning, but I really want a cane pruned grape. Well, then we just treat it like a cane pr pruning grape. And we remove the horizontal, bring one of that new spurs down that we grew and just repeat. It's not as complicated as it looks. It's actually, you're kind of doing the same practices under both scenarios. There's just the slight difference of are your horizontals permanently established or do they get new every year? Yes. Um, trees when you cut limbs off of them, they're more susceptible to the to the disease is the same way? Yeah. There be a special way to treat that open Good question. So there's a question about, you know, whenever you create open wounds on trees and plants, you're creating a potential susceptibility for disease and in insects. Absolutely correct. What all the research shows is there's not anything we're going to do, like a wound covering, a paint, or anything like that, that improves the situation. In some scenarios, it may be useful to do a fungicide spray, but part of this is timing. That's why we do things during the dormant period. Uh, and again, we're more concerned like with berries when we're doing our tip pruning in the summer, which is not the dormant period. Dormant period, we're less likely to have diseases actively spoilating and spreading. Not saying it can't happen, but it's less likely. Same thing with insects. We know a lot of our insects are dormant during the season, uh, during the dormant season. So we're creating a wound basically at the best time possible. So by and large, we do what we need to do and be as minimally impactful as we can be. But like if we're coming in here and converting this cord into a cane, we're going to have some big wounds on there. We just accept it and go on. And hopefully we've got a good, healthy plant. We're providing it what it needs. And so it will close that wound over sooner rather than later. So I can't believe, I may not have saved it. Maybe I added in the picture and didn't save it. I don't know. But I swear the slides I send out to you will show the conversion of this blue selected cane into a new cordon. Because we've had damage here. We've had disease. Something happened. I don't know. Or... Uh oh, this was my Concord. I just realized I'm not getting as good a production as maybe I could. Because typically, canes are thought of being a little more productive than cordons. Um, I wouldn't know to say that's always the case with every variety, but certainly because of the ability that you're renewing that horizontal every year, if there is damage, if there is something going awry, 
you basically start over with brand new productive capacity each season. And so because of that, there is a, a little bit gain in production. So you will sometimes hear people talk about rejuvenating cordons by going to a cane to get new growth. So there, there is uh, perhaps uh, a little bit to be gained with cane pruning in some scenarios. But really, uh, again, they're very similar when you get down to it because flowers are arising from new season growth in both scenarios. It just in one of them, your horizontals are permanent ish. And in the other, you know, you're pulling it out next year. And so you got to make sure you have new ones coming on. That answers a big question. I mean, I thought I had to take the old grapevine plant over the yeah. No, and I mean, it, and it goes back to that truthfully, we shouldn't have ginormous grapevines because yeah. we don't need it to have a productive one. And, and to me, that's the scenario. Sure, we can build a, a 20 foot long grapevine, you know, uh, arbor for a grapevine, but we don't have to do that to get good production because where is our production happening on that new season's growth? So we don't have to have that. And in fact, if we have a big giant one, that means it needs more nutrition. It needs more water. We may be setting ourselves up for a more difficult growing task by having a bigger plant than we absolutely need. So I think it's interesting, but certainly, uh, if you have questions, as with any of the other topics, feel free to reach out to me at my office. Uh, you're going to get that email from me. It's going to have the survey. It's going to have uh, contact details. Same thing as with fruit trees. I'm happy to come out and help you get started. No, I will not prune your grapevines, but I will come out and help you get started. Happy to do that. There's always, how do we go from the pictures or the class to the garden? There's always that translation. I firmly believe if you take 20 trained people that know what they're doing and throw them at the same tree or vine, you'll have 20 different examples and they're probably all correct. It's not an exact science. Um, so just understand, especially, you know, with plants, they're going to grow back. Kind of like a haircut. As long as you've got hair, it'll probably grow back and you can always fix it later. So don't be too intimidated by it. Feel free to reach out if you need further help. So with that, I will pause for questions.